seconds to thank the organizers for inviting me and for putting together this uh, really nice looking um, summer program. All right, so I'm going to be um, interested in um, systems of points or particles, x1, xn, that live in space Rd and interact with an interaction function of this form, an energy of this form, the sum of sort of pair potential terms plus n times sum of v of xi from 1 to n. Okay, so there is a here are some sort of external potential or field. You can call it a confining potential. It's confining because it grows sufficiently fast at infinity. And this thing is the interaction. And G uh, has some very specific forms. So I'm going to consider three cases. Either g is minus log of the distance, and we're in dimension 1, or g is minus log of the distance, and we're in dimension 2, or g is 1 over x to the d minus 2, and we're in dimension larger or equal to 3. OK, so the, the first two cases I will call the logarithmic cases, for obvious reasons. And you can see that this uh, 2D logarithmic case and the higher D um, case here are what correspond to Coulomb cases or to a Coulomb gas. Because, well, simply, uh, minus log is up to a constant, the Coulomb kernel in 2D and 1 over x to the d minus 2 is the Coulomb kernel in 3 and higher d. OK, so the interaction between the particles is specifically, specifically Coulombic. And in dimension 2, there's some, uh, it's uh, something uh, similar, but a little bit different. The log is not the Coulomb kernel, but it's a bit like as if you had a, a 2D Coulomb interaction and you constrained yourself to live on the line. OK, so we can be interested in just minimizing um, these, uh, these functions hn and letting n, of course, uh, go to infinity. Or we can be interested in looking at the situation with temperature. And then you form the Gibbs measure pn beta. So beta would be an inverse temperature. And you would form the Gibbs measure dpn beta x1 xn equals 1 over zn beta exponential minus, so for normalization here I put minus beta over 2 hn dx1 dxn. Okay, so this is called the Gibbs measure. It tells you the uh, essentially the probability of seeing a configuration at x1, xn, if you're at temperature uh, beta. So how are these things related to random matrices? Uh, well, they are via um, uh, things that were discussed actually already today. There's these um, very um, classical and fundamental models of random matrix theory the GOE, the GUE, and the Ginibre ensemble. So here I mean complex Ginibre. So these are um, ensembles where you take uh, n by n matrix and you draw the entries uh, at random to be IID uh, Gaussian. And in the GOE, you ask them to be um, real symmetric, so you ask the matrix to be real symmetric in addition. And in the GUE, it's complex Hermitian. 
in the Genie ensemble, it's just it, it's just complex Gaussian with no uh, no particular um, constraint. So it's a little bit different from what um, Jan Fyodorov was discussing. He was discussing real entries. Here it's complex entries. Okay, and then you compute the law of the eigenvalues for these uh, very specific ensembles, and you find that it has exactly this form. So it's exactly of this type of form for here, of course, uh, dimension one uh, uh, situation because the eigenvalues are on the real line. So this corresponds to dimension one, beta, beta equals one, and V quadratic. Maybe it's x squared over two, I never remember. And this one is still a law for dimension one, beta equals two, and V quadratic. And this one is dimension two, b2 equals two, and v is mod x squared. Okay, so the, um, this corresponds to the logarithmic cases only, and to quadratic uh, confinement potential. So the, the, this is really uh, the model case of what we want to understand. Uh, but we are also interested in looking at more general situations where beta can be different from these values and where V can also be uh, more general. And so that's where, when we call these things uh, Coulomb gas or log gas. And in particular, we're interested in understanding how much of the behavior really depends on V, uh, how it depends on beta, etc. Okay, so this is one uh, possible motivation, uh, random matrix theory. But you can uh, find many motivations that are outside of that. Uh, for Coulomb systems in general, um, just as a statistical uh, mechanics uh, ensemble, uh, for the fractional quantum Hall effect, for uh, vortices in superconductors, which are also systems in which you see points that interact logarithmically. Um, so in a way, you can s see it the other way. You can say eigenvalues of uh, random matrices, they tend to repel each other logarithmically like uh, Coulomb particles. Uh, another motivation is uh, maybe less known in this uh, audience. It's uh, approximation theory and fekete points. So when you want to uh, numerically um, integrate a function, so let's say you're on a surface or something like that, um, you want to numerically uh, approximate the integral of a function by, um, by a Riemann sum, by summing the function of points that are well chosen. Well, the best way to choose your points uh, is to minimize this type of energies. Uh, basically, you want to minimize, let's say you're on a surface, you want to minimize the product of the distances between the points because that's what produces the smallest interpolation error. And minimizing, uh, sorry, you want to maximize this. And maximizing this is the same as minimizing minus sum of log xi minus xj. Um, and then doing it with uh, adding these, uh, an external potential here would correspond to um, uh, looking at fekete points with weights. So this is also uh, very much studied in the approximation theory literature. Uh, and as a result, they're also interested in looking at uh, more general interactions. But, um, so this is, this is a motivation for just looking at minimizing uh, such things. Um, something I, I want to mention right away, you can ha if you have the notes uh, in your computers or somewhere, you can, s you can look at pictures. Uh, when you look at um, vortices in superconductors, which you can show are essentially, uh, their locations minimize an interaction like this in the 2D log case, uh, then you see that vortices in superconductors form uh, triangular lattices. So in experiments, mm, you will see the vortices that are densely packed and they arrange themselves according to what looks, at least to the eye, typically like a perfect triangular lattice, so you make equilateral triangles. 
And if you look at simulations on fakete points on surfaces, they also seem to form triangular lattices. And so this is part of the question is to, to understand uh, why such things come up, um, why they come up at least in, uh, in minimizers of, of these types of energy. Okay, so these are the motivations. So now let's start, um, let me start by recalling some uh, relatively um, cl classical facts about these things. So when you look at uh, configurations like this, you might want to form what is called the empirical measure or the um, spectral measure if you're in looking at random matrices, which is just the probability density that you obtain by summing the Dirac masses at the points of the configuration. Okay, so this is a probability measure. And you want to, you know, typically understand its limit points as n goes to infinity. And if you do that, at least um, formally, you can guess that this is related to the following uh, function or functional iv of mu, which is nothing else than the a continuum version of the interaction energy. So I would look at this. V of x d mu of x over mu probability measures on Rn. And um, it's not too um, difficult to guess that somehow Hn normalized by n squared is going to be behaving like IV of mu. Okay, so if mu n empirical converges to mu, then you expect this, or at least maybe an inequality in this direction is true. All right, so this can actually be made um, rigorous. Uh, so if you want to see that, you, you may want to rewrite this sum as an integral against Dirac masses. So you, you might want to write g of x minus y, Dirac, at xi of x, Dirac at xj of y, etc. So there is a little bit of uh, care to be, to be pay, uh, attention to be paid in the fact that here you have to remove diagonal terms, which mean ter terms for which i equals j, uh, for which the, the energy would be infinite, right? There is no g of xi minus xi because all these uh, for all these potentials, g of zero is zero, is, is infinite. Uh, and here, when you look at this continuum version, somehow this has disappeared. The diagonal is back in the, in the integral. And however, this, this is okay. And what is well known is that, um, okay, this is roughly true. Minimizers of Hn do converge to minimizers of IV, and I will say better, I will say to the minimizer of IV among probabilities. So we'll call it P. And this is called the equilibrium measure. And I will denote it by mu v. Okay, so it's also called the Frostman equilibrium measure. So this problem uh, of minimizing IV is, a, is an old problem, the beginning of potential theory. And it's easy to see that there is a unique minimizer because IV is strictly convex. So you can check. There's a unique minimizer among probability measures. And it has a characterization which you find 
by trying um, variations, right? If you know it's a minimizer, you can try a convex combination of mu v and any other probability, right? This thing will have larger energy than mu v for every t in 0, 1, for every new probability measure. Okay, so try that, expand in t, let t go to 0, and you will obtain some equations, which are essentially like the Euler-Lagrange equation for the minimization of IV. And the result is the following. So assume uh, that V grows sufficiently fast at infinity, it's lower semi-continuous, it's good enough. Then mu V is uniquely characterized by the following relation. The fact that h mu v, I will define what this means, plus v over 2 is bigger than a constant everywhere and is equal to that same constant in the support of mu v. So there exists a certain constant c such that this is true. And here with this notation, h mu for any measure mu, I mean the integral against the kernel G or the convolution with G of mu. Okay, so you can think um, in terms of electrostatics, mu is a distribution of charges, it's a probability density. And if you integrate G of x minus y d mu, you are forming the electrostatic potential generated by mu, the Coulomb potential generated by mu if you're in the Coulomb cases. Okay, and so this thing is telling you that the Coulomb potential plus the uh, external field has to be constant in the support of the equilibrium measure. So it's essentially a variant of the capacitor problem, but with external field. And this is what you obtain when you make the variations I described above. Okay? Any question? Yeah. It can have several connected components. Yeah, it's possible. No, it will be the same constant. Uh, so the only thing you can prove is that um, if V grows sufficiently fast at infinity, mu V has compact support. So it's a compactly supported measure, but it could have uh, several connected components. It depends on V. So I will be interested, uh, I will restrict myself only to situations where um, where mu v is nice, uh, at least where the support of mu v um, is uh, fairly nice, it's a nice set with a nice boundary, it could have several connected components. Um, okay, so as I said, mu v has compact support. And so if you know that what you expect is, um, for nice cases, that mu v has a density. So it's not only a probability measure, but it's a probability with the density, and I will confuse the density and the probability. And, and so if it has a density, and we're in the support here, we have this relation, right, that h mu v plus v over 2 is constant in the support. And now let's uh, restrict ourselves to the Coulomb situations. So let me exclude the first case. If I'm in the Coulomb situation, then what I know is that um, G is the Coulomb kernel, right? So for Coulomb, what is the definition of being the Coulomb kernel? Well, it's the same as saying that you solve minus Laplace and G equals the Dirac mass, right? 
Dirac at the origin, and of course it comes with a constant because I didn't normalize my, uh, my Coulomb kernel properly, but so let's call CD, it depends on dimension, this constant. So in Coulomb cases, you have this relation. Um, and in particular, if you form the potential generated by a uh, measure mu, if you compute its Laplacian, well, it has to be mu up to the constants. Because if you compute the Laplacian, you can take the Laplacian inside the integral, you find the Laplacian of g, you get the Dirac mass, and so what you find it, in the same way is that minus Laplacian h mu is cd times mu. Okay, so now I can look in the support of the equilibrium measure. I can compute the Laplacian of this relation. If you, uh, if you assume that the support is a nice set with an interior, I find that in the interior, minus Laplacian h mu v minus Laplacian v over 2 has to be the Laplacian of the constant, which is 0. Okay, and so that means what? It means CD times mu v is Laplacian v over 2. And so I have a formula for the density of the equilibrium measure, and of course I should multiply by the characteristic function or the indicator function of the support. Okay, so I will denote here from now on sigma, the support of the equilibrium measure. Okay, so it's a little calculation. It tells you that if you have, a, if you know that you have a nice support and with an interior, if you have a regular enough potential V, of course, here I'm taking the Laplacian of V, so I would prefer V to be, say, C2, uh, then uh, I have a formula. But the, the support remains unknown. It's not enough to have this. You still don't know what sigma is, and you cannot uh, find it other than from these sort of implicit uh, relations. Yeah? It's always compact. The, compact. the support is compact. The problem is that mu v could have, uh, I don't know, could be like um, a, a, a singular, you know, a probability on a segment or something like that. It could have a, it could not be um, absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And then you would not be able to write something like that. And it, this could happen. But I, I rule out these situations, okay? I'm, I'm trying to be in the good situation. So if, um, the, in fact, so there are cases where you can explicitly compute the equilibrium measure, and this is, this is enlightening. Uh, the simplest case is to take v quadratic, or in fact v radial would be good already. Because if v is radial, then you can expect by symmetry, uh, you can expect that the equilibrium measure would also be radial, and then you can sort of compute. But let's put ourselves in a situation that's even easier. So if you take v of x equals x squared, if you're in a Coulomb case, then mu v uh, will be, well, the Laplacian of uh, the quadratic function is a constant. So mu v will be some constant. And the support of the equilibrium measure, well, by symmetry, it has to be a disk, right? So it's a characteristic function of a disk. Then you just have to compute the radius. And you have to compute the constant that makes this a probability. Or, or rather, you, you write this. Okay, so this would be um, 1 over CD, I think. And then you find the right radius that makes this uh, a probability measure. And so if you remember, the Genie ensemble was corresponding to um, v, v quadratic. And here you find a characteristic function of a disk. And that corresponds to the, what's called the circle law. 
But for now, I haven't said anything about the situation with temperature. I'm only looking at minimizers. But in a minute, I will say that this is somehow still true, the situation with temperature. Another example that's fundamental, especially for today, is if I take v equals x squared, dimension 1, logarithmic. So then I cannot use this formalism of uh, because I'm not in the Coulomb setting. However, I can tell you that mu v can be computed, and it's identified to be the semicircle law. Okay, so it's square root of 4 minus x squared with the proper constant in front. And so that's the semicircle law that Ioana Dimitriou was talking about this morning. And, and it, it, it fits with what I was describing at the beginning, because the GOE and GUE ensembles correspond to this type of uh, potential. Okay, so now we know what minimizers look like, right? So this, this tells us that, remember, the result is that the empirical measure is going to converge to mu v. So for minimizers, one over n, converges to mu v for minimizers. OK, so I expect that if I have, say, my circle law, always think of the quadratic case as the model. It's a, it's a good model. I expect I'm going to have particles, you know, fairly well distributed in such a way that their, their distribution becomes uniform in this disk. There might be a few points outside, but not too many. It's going to look like that. So this is a first good information on the behavior. Now there is this very nice theorem that tells you that this is not only true for minimizers, it's also true, in fact, for configuration with temperature. And this is phrased in terms of a large deviation principle which tells you that, uh, you remember the, the Gibbs measure, the situation with temperature that I raised before, but it's this. So by the way, um, I didn't say, but Z and beta, uh, what is it? It's just a constant, which is the normalization so that this is a probability me measure. Okay, so you want this to integrate to one, it means you have to divide by an appropriate constant, which is actually not so well known. Uh, and, and the study of that constant is of interest on its own. But okay, so this probability uh, density now admits an LDP at speed n squared and rate function IV minus IV of mu V. Okay, I, I will explain. Huh? Of course, this is the same as mean IV, as we have seen. Okay, so what does it mean to have a large deviation principle, blah, blah, blah? Um, if you want a formal definition, it, uh, it's written in the notes, but an informal definition is that the probability that um, the empirical measure is in a certain subset of the space of probability measures is roughly behaving like exponential minus beta n squared the minimum over A of IV minus IV of mu V. Okay, so I'm, there's a discussion here of closure and interior, but 
th this is the rough uh, statement. Okay, so now let's look at this. The exponential here, okay, the exponent is always non-negative here. This is non-negative, so you have exponential of a negative number, it's always less than one, which is good, it's a probability. And you will see that this exponential is actually uh, decreasing very fast as n goes to infinity, so it's exponentially decreasing as soon as this is positive. Okay, so this probability tends to zero exponentially fast, except if this thing happens to be zero, which means if the mean of IV over A is equal to the mean of IV. Okay, it means the probability tends to zero, except if the set A contains mu V, okay, because mu V is the only minimizer. Okay, so this goes to zero, except if mu V is contained in A. And now imagine that I take A to be a smaller and smaller neighborhood of the limit of the empirical measures, right? So if one over n converges to some mu, and if mu is different from mu v, essentially this is telling me that uh, the probability of such events goes to zero. In other words, uh, the only configurations that are observed that have non-zero probability are those that converge to mu v. Right? Another way of saying this is this converges to mu v except with very small probability. And so you see it means that Typical configurations, even with temperature, they, they will do the same as what the minimizers do. They will look like mu v. Yes? I v is the functional I defined before that I erased. It's a probability measure. Okay, mu in A, IV of mu. Hmm? Right? Is it clear now? Is it better? 